Hi, my name is Dr. Micah Wright. I am the program manager for the Military Health Institute. Thank you for attending the introduction to Department of Defense grant funding for the School of Dentistry. Just to give you an overview of what we're gonna talk about today, is we're gonna talk about MHI, the Military Health Institute, give you a brief overview of the different uniform services, give you a little bit of organization for DOD research, gives you tips for success, and talk about the type of support that MHI provides and give a little additional useful information. We'll leave some time at the end just in case you have any questions. All right, so the Military Health Institute, our mission is to strengthen UT Health San Antonio's collaborative efforts with government and non-government organizations like the military, the DOD, improving the health and resiliency of our nation's military service members, veterans, and their families. We say military health is in our DNA because we really believe in our mission. Uh, for myself, I'm a wounded Marine. Uh, I was in combat and uh, was wounded and actually was medically retired and experienced the military health system in a different way. The mission we do here is incredibly important. To give you an example, in the picture is Staff Sergeant Shiloh Harris. Staff Sergeant Harris was burned over 80% of his body. Because of the advancements in military health, he's able to live today and live a full life with his beautiful daughter. We focus on four pillars, research, education, clinical advocacy, and engagement. Research is our top pillar because our advancements in research are what take us to the next level for military health. This is the support that we provide. We provide awareness of DOD grant opportunities. Uh, we mentor on DOD grant proposal development. We have a faculty associates program um, that you'll see, see Dr. Hargraves here in just a little bit, who is actually on and will mentor, um, mentor faculty on writing a grant. We connect researchers with potential military partners. We coordinate formal draft pro proposal review, and we support with letters of endorsement, showing institutional support for the research that you're doing. We also establish a number of partnering agreements to facilitate our collaborative efforts. So just briefly, I wanna go over the different uniform branches. Now, you may not know this, but there are actually eight uniform branches, and they're kind of spread out um, within the government. The Department of Defense, you have the United States Army, the Marine Corps, United States Navy, United States Air Force, and the Space Force. Now, something to know is that the Marine Corps is actually a branch of the Navy. So when you're looking at research, the Office of Naval Research will do the research on the Marine Corps. And the Space Force, newly a new branch, um, is part of the Air Force. So the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, that's where you'll see a lot of that research coming out. Now, there's some little known um, other branches, Department of Homeland Security, we have the Coast Guard, the Coasties, uh, protecting our, our uh, borders and protecting our nation. Department of Health and Human Services, and then Department of Commerce, you have the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. On the right, you can see the different sizes of the branches, the Army being the biggest. A lot of military health research comes out of the Army because of their size and funding but each branch has funding and research specific to them. Now, understanding the uniform mission of each branch is incredibly important when you're writing a grant because each branch has a different mission and they have a different focus. The Army is a land force. The Marines are a Naval Expeditionary Force. So a lot of the things that we research will have to do with the Navy and have to do with um, sea time assaults. Air Force, air superiority, superiority, and now space superiority are gonna be two of the biggest uh, emphasis. Coast Guard, National Maritime Force. So they're worried about national security and worried about being that maritime force. It's really important once you understand those missions, understanding the primary mission of all of those branches is understanding medical readiness. Prevention, injury and disease. For instance, if we're training, um, Injury is unfortunately inevitable. It's going to happen. So how do we prevent injury? One, but also how do we help those who are injured on a human performance uh, basis and get them back to the mission at hand? Performance optimization, operational medicine, especially in trauma and infectious disease, behavioral health, 
Something to understand about this too is that medical readiness will change depending on the threat that we have at the time. So think of the emerging threats that we have with our nation right now, Russia, China, the battle in uh, the war in Ukraine. Readiness is gonna change based on the threats that are relative to those um, areas. Understanding military terminology is also really important. Um, to give you an example, soldier and Marine are two different things. I was in the Marines. I don't get mad if you called me a soldier, but I definitely correct you. Um, airman, Coast Guard, you're gonna see things like warfighter in the grants. Understanding that a veteran is somebody who served in the armed forces. As you go through the grants, you'll find new keywords that aren't on this list. That's why MHI is here to help you through that grant process. Now we're gonna move into DOD research organization. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Ken Hargraves, who received his BA in neurobiology from the University of California at Berkeley and earned his DDS from Georgetown University in Washington. He is a faculty associate member uh, an esteemed colleague, and I'm happy to be presenting with him today. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So uh, what type of research is actually supported uh, by the Department of Defense? Well, in terms of DOD research dollars, we're talking about $2 billion a year. This is requisition driven. So there are going to be broad agency announcements that we need to respond to. And those broad agency announcements will be in specified areas of a research interest. These are investigator driven. So the investigators are writing these. And CDMRP, a congressionally directed medical research program is $550 million just for cancer. To compare this to other types of federal funding, the NIH is about $43 billion. The VA is about $2.1 billion. And BARDA is about $1.6 billion. The research process with the Department of Defense can be complicated uh, to be able to navigate. And that's why we're here with you today to give you the broad overview and to give you one example of a project that was submitted from our dental school. In terms of the MRDC, this is the Medical Research and Development Com Command. The responsibility and to uh, be able to create, develop, acquire, and deliver capabilities for the warfighter. Uh, their assignment is also to lead the advancement of military medicine, to protect service members from injury or illness, to be able to focus on battlefield readiness. And there's five key areas of focus, and that is infectious disease, combat casualty care, military operational medicine, chemical biological defense, and finally, clinical and rehabilitative medicine. So the MRDC uh, is uh, available on the website where you can get more information about this particular uh, OVA program. In terms of the Naval Medical Research Unit, this is under the Office of Naval Research. There are eight medical research units in San Antonio is focused on medical issues, craniofacial issues, and biomedical issues. And they're to enhance the health, safety, performance, and operational readiness of both Navy and Mil Marine Corps. A good example of studies funded by NAMRU is by our own Dr. Kuman Wang. Uh, he has a project that was supported entitled Effects of Acetaminophen on Neurocell Status. And this was complete from 2010 to uh, 2011. Another one is antimicrobial resin and coding for the prevention of infection. So good examples of dental school faculty receiving military relevant research funding. Now, what about the congressionally directed medical research program? This is under the US Army Medical Research and Development Command. It's actually funded by congressional appropriations and it has target to critical gaps in research. It's a two-tier two peer review process, much like the NIH type of approach where we have first a study section of peer review followed by programmatic review, and it has a consumer involvement as well. So when I've been on uh, CDMRP study sections, about one third of study section members are military officers, one third are scientists, they may or may not be affiliated with the military, and interesting, one third is patients or patient advocates. You need to think about all of those audience groups when you're preparing your grants, so that your grant will resonate with each of those groups. Um, there's a strong history of congressional appropriations using this particular program. 
Now, it's impossible to read this font on the screen right here. Please don't worry about that. If you simply go to CDMRP or Google that, you'll be able to find the current and past uh, research areas of interest. Now, in my own application, this was a CDMRP followed by a second CDMRP. The first CDMRP grant was to basically try to identify novel targets to be able to develop non-opioid, non-addictive analgesics for treatment of burn pain. The second program was to actually use that information and try to develop commercially viable non-opioid analgesics based on the research that we've had before. So our general model that we had, all these figures are actually taken from my grant application. So you can see the level of detail that we provide. This first figure is really a cartoon trying to get the reviewers up to speed on what the biology is that we're studying. And that is in response to burden injury, we have rapid oxidation of cell membranes causing the release of a number of lipids that are derived from either LA, which is a linoleic acid, or AA, which is arachidonic acid. These are quickly oxidized by a number of oxidative enzymes into what are called oxylipins. These are the OLAMs and OAMs that we've worked on for the last 10 years or so. And these oxidized lipids serve as endogenous lipids to trip-gated channels, such as the capsaicin receptor, trip V1, or the mustard oil receptor, trip A1. So the key step here is the important role that oxidative enzymes play in the generation of this pain-producing mediators. And the rationale of this application is to be able to develop drugs that block this key oxidative step to be able to block the generation of these painful lipid mediators. Um, and in fact, there's good evidence that this in fact occurs in human burn injury. So we were able to take a human skin biopsies from the Institute for Surgical Research uh, located here in San Antonio from uh, burn wound debridements of uh, service members. And we took lipid extracts of skin and you can see evaluated on the y-axis is paw withdrawal latency, the amount of seconds it takes an animal to withdraw their paw from a heat stimulus. The black bar is basal conditions, the green bar is lipid extracts from control skin. You can see there's no effect on the pain system. The pink bar shows the development of uh, rapid thermal hyperalgesia when we inject the animals with the lipid extract from burn skin. And this is due to the generation of endogenous trip V1 agonists because we can completely reverse this effect by administration, co-administration of a trip V1 antagonist along with the lipid extracts of burned skin. So the blue bar shows the effect of capsaicin reversal as effect. The conclusion is that human skin from active duty uh, uh, service members who undergo burn injury actually contains a very high concentration of these trip active lipids that are capable of producing pain responses when administered to animals. In fact, if we do mass spectrometry analysis of these lipid extracts, we can see a number of oxylipins are significantly elevated in extracts from burn human skin. Those are the four bars on the right, as compared to extracts from normal human skin. Finally, and again, the slides are difficult to read, we developed an animal model of partial thickness burn injury, so a second degree burn. And we're able to show that injection of an oxidative enzyme inhibitor uh, completely reversed this effect. This is a non-opioid, non-addictive compound. If we administer it for weeks on end to animals, there's no effects on dependence or tolerance at all. And in this animal model, we can also show that we can reverse this effect with trip V1 antagonists. So we have an animal in vivo model that parallels what happens in humans after burn injury. We then went to a cell level and evaluated the effects using patch clamp electrophysiology to be able to identify which oxidative enzymes play a key role in the generation of these painful oxylipids. So we ended up with identifying about eight or nine oxidative enzymes that are capable of generating these painful oxidized lipid metabolites. Well, then we went back to human skin and evaluated in burn skin versus normal skin what oxidative enzymes were upregulated. So this is a microarray. Don't worry about reading it. Just look at the red stuff at the top. Uh, this is a color code for gene expression. And it turns out that the same eight oxidative enzymes that can form these painful lipids are also upregulated in humans after burn injury. So basically, if you will, it's a smoking gun. We have good evidence that these enzymes are capable of forming pain-producing lipids 
And these same enzymes are upregulated in humans after burn injury. So then we developed a stable cell line to conduct high throughput screening of thousands of compounds to find out compounds that would inhibit those eight oxidative enzymes. And here's the result. So we're evaluating on the y-axis the percent maximal possible effect from a high throughput screen conducted here on our campus at the Center for Innovation in Drug Discovery. So the higher you go on this y-axis, the greater activity we have in trip channels. You can see administration of linoleic acid, which is the precursor for these oxidized lipids. That's the black bar, the very first bar, causes a maximal effect that we have normalized to 100%. If we block the trip B1 receptor with AMG 517 or capsaicepine, we can abolish this effect. Or if we use voriconazole, which is an oxidative enzyme inhibitor, we can also block this effect. And then you see about 12 to 13 compounds to the right that all are capable of inhibiting this effect as well. So we actually discovered a family of novel, previously undescribed compounds capable of inhibiting the generation of these pain-producing lipids that are found in human burned skin. We evaluated the effects for cytotoxicity and were able to show that three of our lead compounds have no effects on acute cytotoxicity at all. We used hexachlorophene, shown in black, as a positive control just to show that we could detect toxicity if it were to occur. So that was the background data for and the data that was included in my CDMRP application. Here are the four specific aims of the new grant. Aim one is contract with Charles River Laboratories for a confidential uh, medicinal chemistry program to basically develop second generation and third generation compounds capable of effectively inhibiting burn pain without having systemic toxicity. Aim two is to evaluate the activity of these lead compounds with in vitro screening for inhibiting linoleic acid induced calcium influx using the same cell lines that I've shown earlier. AIM-3 is a test the lead compounds for drug tolerance. We want compounds that not only are non-opioid and non-addictive, we don't want to have tolerance so that the same dose that way would repeatedly and effectively relieve pain in our patients. And then finally, to use GLP standards to determine animal safety and toxicity testing at the lead compounds to be able to complete uh, the readiness five requirements for this particular application. So that's an example of the type of data that you can generate and the type of aims that you uh, propose for CDMRP applications. Here are some general thoughts to consider. Again, to remember the study section composition. There are three different groups of individuals around that study section that are going to review your application. Make sure your application resonates with all of them. So even though we may be talking about the formation of oxylipins and high throughput screens, there needs to be enough practical information so that patients or patient advocates can understand the implications of what we're trying to do. In other words, we need to maximize the translational significance of the application. Focus on practical applications of your results and make sure that you include power analyses for statisticians on the group. You need to spend some time on the statement of work. This is a critical component of these applications. The CDMRP program is much more a contract than it is a grant. So you really have to specify in very high detail what you're going to do at each step, and then they will be basically measure that progress in your quarterly and annual reports. And finally, there are a lot of quarterly reports, so make sure to add some admin support to your budget in terms of assistance in preparing these reports. And I'll send that back to Mike now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hargraves. Okay, so next we have the United States Army Dental and Trauma Research Department. Now, a part of the Army, you're gonna find this out of the Army Institute of Surgical Research. This is actually the largest military dental research organization in the Department of Defense. They focus on the study of injuries to the cranial maxillofacial complex, and they really look at explosions from IEDs and landmines and how they've resulted in trauma and burns. They look at three challenges, CMF, regenerative medicine, biofilm, impaired wound healing, and amelioration of scar formation and soft tissues. So here is a good example of a DOD grant, grant relative to dental, and that's the chronic pain management grant that Dr. Hargraves actually applied for. You'll see this um, under CDMRP, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. 
Now, this comes out of congressional appropriations where Congress gets together and talks about what issues are big and submits funding for them. Um, although it is a DOD grant, this is still a little bit more general um, as opposed to something you get from like the Office of Naval Research or Department of Army. This is gonna be a little bit more relative, CDMRP grants. There's still a military readiness factor involved with it. However, um, you'll be able to look at this and really apply yourself to it. The DOD grant process in a nutshell um, depends on what service or what um, institution you're submitting your grant to. For CDMRP, for example, they're gonna have a pre-proposal that you have to submit. And then they're gonna look at the pre-proposals and tell you whether you're invited to submit for funding. And then you'll have to submit a full proposal. Um, other organizations just want a white paper or an abstract or sometimes no pre-proposal at all. So just being able to go through the funding announcement and understanding what's needed is important and we can help you with that. Different websites to look at is ebrap.org, definitely signing up for that and looking at for announcements, CDMRP and grants.gov, um, and going and clicking Department of Defense and saving that search is gonna help you um, know what grants are coming out. The Military Health Institute actually keeps an active spreadsheet that if you go to our uh, SharePoint site, you can actually see the spreadsheet of current DOD grants. So another one is something that's called an OTA or an Other Transaction Agreement, and that is MTEC, the Medical Modeling and Simulation Consortium. What they do is serve as kind of a mediator for Department of De Defense funding. They work with industry, academia, um, and government, military institutions, as well as uh, the private sector. You have to have membership. Luckily, MHI actually has a membership, so does the UT system. So any researcher in the UT system can submit to MTech a grant. MTech grant, excuse me. Their big mission is advancing biomedicine. So if you can apply to that, that's good. And again, we keep all of these updated on a spreadsheet. MTech focus areas, military infectious disease, combat casualty care research program, clinical and rehabilitative medicine research program, military operational medicine research program, and something that's very current for us right now is a medical simulation and information sciences research program. We actually submitted as part of a consortium to MTEC um, for met modeling and simulation. Um, our trauma department is very active with it. Our uh, nursing department is very active with it. And it's actually partnered with University of Pittsburgh, Uniformed Services University or USU, Mayo Clinic, University of Maryland, um, and then us as well. So that partnership allows us to get funding, 810,000 for two years, uh, looking at skill degrade, 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 degradation for, um, for trauma, uh, trauma surgeons. So this participation and through MTech is another avenue that you can look at for funding. So tips for successful DOD submissions. Understand the military and congressional purpose. This is key. Going through and understanding where it comes from. If it comes from CDMRP, you wanna make sure that you understand what the congressional purpose of it, what, what impact are they looking for? Like Dr. Hargraves talked about before, there's consumer involvement. So they really wanna know what impact your research is gonna have on those consumers. Understanding military purpose. Is it through the Office of Naval Research or Army Institute of Surgical Research? What type of readiness are they thinking about? Look for those key words in their goal statements and be specific. That's something that we can help you out through grant review. Seek military research partners. Although you can submit research on your own, if you have a partner who is in the military, it shows military relevance. It helps you get approved for grants and it also helps you seek out military populations by working with the military. And we can also assist with that. Seek mentoring. I, I don't care what level of researcher you are, seek that mentoring with any grant, find out if there's anybody who submitted to that grant before and what their experience is and go through some sort of formal grant review. So this is the support that we provide so that you can 
uh, go through all of those steps to have a successful submission. We facilitate collaborations. Some of our current military co collaborations, you can see through the trauma think tank in the Department of Surgery, uh, Dr. Michael List, the Mays Cancer Center, we've been working with them. Dr. Yogesh Gupta with Dr. Jason Oculix from Infectious Disease at BAMSI. We help connect them, Dr. Kumar Sharna, Sharma and Dr. Colonel Kevin Chung with the ser Serif Pathogen fil Filter. Dr. Chung actually works at Uniform Services University. So we are happy to help facilitate any collaboration that's gonna help your research move forward. We provide that mentorship and review. Like I mentioned before, we have what's called a faculty associates program. So these mentors have successfully submitted DOD grants. They have a lot of experience with the DOD and VA. I always like to give out sh a shout out to one of our faculty associates, um, Dr. Stacy young McCoggin. She actually worked with CDMRP and is very knowledgeable of the process. And they give you this network of support. And essentially the process is that you talk to me or Dr. Hepburn or uh, Marion Bounds, and we're gonna find you the right mentor to connect with. We provide letters of endorsement. We want to show institutional support. And these letters come from not just MHI, but from our director, who is a major general retired from the Air Force. So it shows that you have a little bit of support behind your research, not just with us, but also from somebody who understands that medical readiness. If you submit a request for a letter, we have a template. We make it really easy for you. Networking opportunities, looking at MHI events. We have a distinguished lecture that we hold typically two times a year. On April the 28th, we're going to have the DHA, the Defense Health Agency director here in San Antonio, here at UT Health, giving a distinguished lecture. His name is Lieutenant General Place. You definitely should plan on going. We have quarterly research meetings with all the deans of research. Going to that meeting is good because you can see what impact we're making and what we're doing, and then also make suggestions to help you out more. We have the Military Health Interest Group, or MHIG. It's a student group. They put on events. Uh, we've done a Wounded Warrior panel with them. Uh, we have Brigadier General Andrus coming on April the 18th to talk to them. Um, he's from the 7-11th 7-11th Human Performance Wing. Um, there's also external events, San Antonio Military Health System and Universities Forum, or SURF, happens at UTSA every year, and it's in June, and it is a network of military health researchers that you can talk to. Um, MHSRS, or the Military Health System Research Symposium, is also a great event to go. It's in Florida in August every year. You have to wait until they send out the announcement of what the date is and open for registration, but if you're interested in going, let us know and we can help facilitate that registration. These are kind of the basic recommendations, you know, not just for DOD research, but any research you're doing, but stay connected, sign up for the funding alerts. Knowledge of what grants are out there are gonna make you that much better at applying for them. Grants.gov is a great place to go to look at all the different grants that are out there. Um, EBREP, like we talked about before, Staying connected to that network of military research is gonna help you move forward with that DOD research. Seek multi-level review. We will review your grant as many times as you want to make sure that it is successful. Here is just a good shout out for the eighth annual SURF. Definitely think y'all should go. If you have any questions, you can contact me directly and I'm happy to help you out. Here's some additional useful information. I'm gonna make sure the School of Dentistry has this PowerPoint. Um, so you can have these links as well. So there's our contact information. You can contact Dr. Hepburn directly or myself. We're happy to help you out um, and help facilitate your DOD research. Do we have any questions? Peacock, uh, can I ask a, a quick question? Sorry okay, what's your question? So, um, what I was thinking was that um, uh, one time we remember bringing a uh, doing a workshop from a DOD um, program officer coming over as well as then giving us the insights. What can we do for that? Do we have that program again? The DOD workshop? Yeah. Yeah, we, we'll give DOD workshops throughout the year. Um, we give general ones um, where it's just for anybody who wants to come and we invite everyone and we're also uh, like today, and we also do one for the School of Nursing where we give these tailored DOD workshops. 
beyond those workshops, if you see a grant that you're interested in, we can give you a personal workshop where we go through the grant with you. I've actually written templates for uh, researchers of grants to help them fill out um, any application or proposal they need. No, uh, Mika, I, I remember a long time back, the School of Medicine actually organized a really big workshop where they brought in the CDM of RP program officer as well as uh, scientific review officers here to really give us the background. I, I don't know if that's something that's going to happen now or no. Yeah, we yeah, can we definitely, definitely do that. Um, you know, maybe we can connect afterwards and we definitely put something like that together. Um, and I think it'd be really great to have a faculty associates there and have a nice dive deep into that DOD research. Any other questions? Uh, hi, I have, a, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, thank you and Dr. Hargraves for presenting today. This has been really, really helpful. Um, I have two questions. So one is on the MTech. I know I had a proposal that, but I was working through UTSA, but I think that's probably the wrong approach. It's better to go through the Military Health Institute. There, I, I was under the impression that they were controlling that grant. So I think it probably just depends on your research and who the PI is. Um, but definitely, if if you're going through UTSA, we can help you out as well. And even if you're using UTSA's membership to submit to MTech, we'll still help you out and make sure that your grant, your submission uh, is top notch. OK, thank you. What is the is there any relationship between um, the military and uh, the national labs? I know they're the Department of Energy, but they're doing a lot on defense. I've, I've worked with several of them. That may be a good question for Dr. Hargraves. I, I'll be honest, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm sure there is a connection, but I'll research that um, that answer and I'll get back with you. Also, uh, Mika, maybe I can ask this question. I know we've been asking for, for people like some of us who works on neuro degeneration to see uh, if, if anybody locally at BAMC is involved, but there is nobody in BAMC in, in that case. Um, what can we, you guys do to really help us find a, a collaborator? Because as you know, for some of those grants, you if you have a, a, an army person involved in the grant, it the, 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 the second tier makes it really easier um, to get those kind of grants. Yeah, and we can definitely help with any collaboration. Um, and really what we do with the collaborations is we, we look at your research um, and we use our network to kind of figure out who's doing the same kind of research or work and we we connect you to the right people. Um, and it's it's honestly different every time uh, of who that is. Any other questions? All right, thank you all very much for attending. If you need any support at all with DOD grants, please do not hesitate to contact me. My contact information uh, is right there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it.